Chapter 10. In this chapter, we're going to continue following tooth development, this time focusing on dentin and pulp, paying particular attention to the things that happen during embryological development that help us to understand why dentin and pulp have their shapes and functions in adulthood. This is a quick review of all of the things that have been happening. I put some of the major orofacial events on the left-hand column. The events that we're talking about in this chapter are starting around week six. So just after the palate begins forming, but before the palate has fused together, we're going to start forming tooth buds. That's just going to take a couple of weeks. They will continue to develop. And then by week 20, the tooth buds of the permanent teeth are going to begin to form. We often refer to the dentin and the pulp at the same time, calling them the dentin pulp complex. That's because they're part of the same family. They share lineage. They both come from mesenchymal stem cells. That makes them different from enamel, which came from that inner enamel epithelium. And that's why the enamel had its own chapter, and these two have to share. Dentin is similar to both bone tissue and enamel. Dentin has collagen fibers, which makes it different from enamel, but more similar to bone. And that's because both bone and dentin come from mesenchyme, or a type of connective tissue. On the other hand, dentin has a little bit less collagen than bone, and a little bit more of the mineral components primarily calcium phosphate crystals, but not quite as much as enamel. That makes dentin a little bit softer than enamel, but a little bit harder than bone tissue. Whereas enamel was primarily colorless, dentin is more opaque and yellowish and gives teeth their color. The thickness of the overlying enamel will determine how much of the underlying dentin is visible from the surface. When enamel is lost, the more yellowish dentin becomes more visible, as we can see here in this photograph. The formation of dentin is called dentinogenesis. The cells that make the dentin are called odontoblasts, and they initially make pre-dentin, or an immature, squishy form of dentin that will later mineralize and harden. So over here in this image, we can see the arrows are pointing to the cell bodies of the odontoblasts. So these are the nucleuses of those cells over here. And as we've talked about in previous lectures, these cells leave behind little extensions called odontoblastic processes. Now the direction that I just drew that line is the opposite direction of growth. Growth began somewhere over here and moved in this direction. That's why you see the pre-dentin over here in this layer and it later mineralizes to the more mature form of dentin over here. On the other side of this dentin is the connective tissue known as the pulp. That's what we're seeing over here. If you squint, you might be able to make out some of the kind of flattened star-like shell cells that are indicative of a generic connective tissue. That would place the enamel somewhere over in this direction of the image. But of course, we're zoomed in too close to see that. When you see images with stripes like this, remember that could either be dentin or enamel. They both have that striped appearance. In the case of dentin, these stripes are caused by the odontoblastic process, whereas in enamel, we learned that those stripes were formed because enamel is formed in rods. Each individual ameloblast forms a single rod of enamel. 
So what we are learning about now is taking place at the same time as the previous chapter, when we learned about the formation of enamel. And in that chapter, we learned that the first thing to happen was the differentiation of these inner enamel epithelial cells began, but it didn't finish first. So some of these epithelial cuboidal cells begin to elongate and turn into more columnar inner enamel epithelial cells. And these are now pre-ameloblasts. Those pre-ameloblasts are in contact with some of the mesenchymal stem cells in the dental papilla, but not the rest of those mesenchymal stem cells down here. And so when the pre-ameloblasts secrete a morphogen, it will cause just the nearby mesenchymal stem cells to differentiate. They will migrate and begin repolarizing themselves opposite of the pre-ameloblasts and differentiate into odontoblasts, and they begin secreting dentin in that immature form that we call pre-dentin. It's important to note that dentin formation happens first, before enamel formation. And for that reason, the dentin layer should always be a little bit thicker than the enamel layer. Going back to our actual microscope image, the pre-dentin is the non-mineralized dentin, as we can see here, but it will begin to mineralize and form the more mature solid dentin. The mineralization does not occur uniformly. It forms in globs. These globs should fuse with other globs to form a more uniform solid layer of dentin. But sometimes some of the globs don't fully mineralize and we're left with interglobular dentin. I suspect this is somewhat similar to taking a bunch of flour and throwing water in it as you're trying to make a cake or a cookie. It takes a lot of mixing to get the water and the flour to gelatinize with one another. I imagine that some of the minerals will not fully crystallize if everything around them solidifies first. That'll make it harder for some globs to finish the process. The same way that if you don't mix your flour and water together well enough, you'll wind up with some pockets of fluffy, more crystallized flour that has not mixed with water. When the odontoblasts begin dentin formation, they are of course starting that process up here at the junction between the enamel and the dentin, and they grow down in this direction. But as they grow, they do not follow perfectly straight lines, and instead the dentinal tubules bend. The primary curvature represents major bends in the growth of the dentin. Secondary curvatures represent smaller changes in direction. Both of these combined ensure that dentin is not produced in a completely parallel fashion. And for that reason, it will actually increase the tensile strength of this material. Now, I don't know what your childhood was like, but perhaps it was your chore to chop wood. And if you have ever chopped wood using an ax against the grain versus split wood using an ax along the grain, you understand the difference between the two. Going against a grain is very difficult and requires a lot of hard work and muscular strength. But splitting wood along the grain simply requires some speed and doesn't require nearly as much physical effort. Dentin, therefore, by not having a grain that can be easily split, is a lot stronger. And that's the clinical significance.
of these two different types of curvatures. Dentin is formed in columns similar to the way that enamel was formed. Each odontoblast is responsible for its own little area of dentin. But different from enamel, those odontoblasts leave behind little extensions of themselves called the odontoblastic processes, which are not visible in this image. But what you can see is that when dentin mineralizes around those processes, it leaves behind a little tubule. So those are gaps in the dentin. The dentin right around the border of those tubes is called peritubular dentin, and the dentin in between individual tubes is called intertubular dentin. We talked about something similar with enamel, which had strong clinical significance because those two different types of enamel were susceptible to acid erosion at different speeds. And therefore, acid etching could be used to increase the surface area of enamel to improve the ability of sealants to adhere to enamel. I don't know of any clinical significance between understanding the difference between peritubular and intertubular dentin. But another way of talking about different types of dentin is more macroscopic. That previous one was microscopic. Now we're looking at the view of the whole tooth and we can talk about mantle dentin versus circumpulpal dentin. The mantle dentin forms first and the circumpulpal dentin forms afterwards. The collagen fibers and the odontoblastic processes in the mantle dentin run perpendicular to the dentino enamel junction. So that junction more or less runs in this direction and those collagen fibers and odontoblastic processes are running perpendicular to that. Whereas around the pulp, the fibers are running more or less parallel to that junction. Another way that we can talk about different types of dentin is about when it was formed. Primary dentin is formed before the formation of the apical foramen, whereas secondary dentin is formed afterwards. So we'll have a layer of primary dentin here. Secondary dentin is going to always be closer to the pulp. Because remember, the dentin began forming over here, so we make primary dentin first, and then after the apical foramen forms, everything afterwards is secondary dentin as we grow inwards. Tertiary dentin can be formed after an injury. There are still going to be living odontoblasts in the pulp, but if more odontoblasts are needed, then mesenchymal stem cells can be induced to differentiate into new odontoblasts. And these cells can produce dentin after the eruption of the tooth. So this is happening long after development. This can also be called reparative dentin. And keep in mind that when we are releasing morphogens, to induce mesenchymal stem cells to turn into odontoblasts, that is something that happened within the first 10 to 20 weeks of embryological development normally, but we can do it again later in adulthood in response to an injury. And so one of our phrases that you might remember from when we talked about the gums is that wound healing recapitulates morphogenesis. In the gums, epithelial cells might have needed to mimic gastrulation to go from an epithelium to a mesenchymal stem cell and then migrate into the wound area and differentiate back into an epithelial cell to produce new keratinocytes. Here, we're producing new odontoblasts from mesenchymal stem cells in the same way that we did this in the first place when the teeth were forming. Tertiary dentin 
is made in response to an acute injury in a localized area of the tooth. Sclerotic dentin, on the other hand, is produced in response to a chronic injury. For instance, with untreated periodontitis, we get chronic inflammation. That chronic inflammatory response prevents odontoblasts from doing the job that they really want to do, and instead they do something that's more similar to scar tissue formation. We're just going to fill up the gap as quickly as we can, and it's not going to be very clean, it's not going to be very accurate, but we're just trying to do the best that we can in response to an ongoing injury. So when sclerotic dentin is formed, the odontoblastic processes are not produced, and instead solid dentin is formed, and any dentinal tubules get filled in with dentin. This is much more similar to scar tissue formation in the skin, rather than skin being able to repair itself properly after an injury. Here's my summary slide of the different types of dentin. So keep in mind, if you were to look at any part of the dentin in a tooth, it would be either peri or intertubular dentin if you were zoomed way in. But then if you zoomed out, you might notice that it was either mantle or circumpulpal. And the mantle dentin is probably primary dentin, whereas circumpulpal dentin is probably secondary dentin. And these two, tertiary and sclerotic dentin, are going to be forming long after the teeth have erupted, after they suffered some sort of injury, whereas the rest of these are developing pre previous to the eruption of the teeth. So this is happening during embryogenesis. Okay, so next let's talk about some of the things that we can see in dentin under the microscope. And let's remember a little bit about enamel because there's going to be a lot of similarities. Enamel was formed by ameloblasts, and each ameloblast made one little column, or enamel rod. And that rod got longer and longer and longer as that ameloblast made more enamel. But because different ameloblasts made different rods, we could see these long horizontal lines in the enamel after it was produced. And that represented the border between one rod and another rod. Here in dentin, and that's what we're actually looking at now, we see similar horizontal lines, but these lines represent the odontoblasts found within the odontoblastic process. And this is in the very middle of the dentin being made by one odontoblast not at the edges, which is what we were seeing in enamel. Now, next, enamel was made by ameloblasts, which went on a circadian rhythm. They sped up and slowed down on a 24-hour cycle. And that meant that the enamel that they were making was thicker and thinner, thicker and thinner, thicker and thinner. And dentin is also made on a circadian rhythm, the same one. And therefore, dentin also has a similar banding pattern to it. Those bands have been named the imbrication lines of von Ebner. One of them is a lot thicker than the rest and is called the neonatal line. And that represents the odontoblasts taking a day off on the day that we were born. That can also be called one of the contour lines of Owen. I guess he got to take over the name of one of the imbrication lines of von Ebner and said, these look even bigger. I'm going to name them. Next up, if you were to look at the dentin in the roots, not up in the mantle dentin, but down in root dentin, you would notice all of these spots. And you might be tempted to say, wow, those look like nucleuses. But what we're looking at here is dentin from roughly here to here, and then we've got a thin layer of cementum after that. And remember that down in the roots, the cementum is what you're going to have 
on the apical surface rather than enamel. So dentin formation began here and it's growing in this direction. Therefore, the nucleuses of the odontoblasts are going to be found somewhere over here. So these spots are just spots. And Tomes named those spots after himself, just like he named Tomes' process on those ameloblasts. I think maybe he was hoping these spots would be something really useful and important, but as of today, they're just spots. We don't know what causes them, and I don't know of any clinical significance to these spots, other than it would let you know you're looking at root dentin rather than mantle dentin. So let's summarize all of the things that we can see in dentin. First off, the odontoblasts form first at the dentino enamel junction, and they help to induce the differentiation of ameloblasts. But they will begin forming dentin in layers, going on a 24 hour cycle and pushing down inwards towards what will eventually be the pulp. At this point, it's just the dental papilla. They take a break on the day that we're born. Whoops, sorry, I'm not there yet. The odontoblastic processes and the collagen fibers of this mantle dentin are running perpendicular to the dentino enamel junction. Okay, now they take a break on the day that we're born. And so this darker line here represents one of the contour lines of Owen, which is just a bigger, thicker, imbrication line of von Ebner. These horizontal lines represent the 24-hour cycle of dentin formation. But we're going to keep forming more dentin, and as you might notice, as we're moving inwards, the cells are getting squished together. Initially, we had a nice single line of odontoblasts, but now they're getting a little bit crowded. And so the odontoblasts are having to form two or three or four cell layers. But they are all leaving behind odontoblastic processes through the entire length of the dentin that they are producing. In the roots, for whatever reason, there's going to be this grainy layer called Tomes granular layer. So that's not something you would see up in the mantle dentin. Next up, talk a little bit more about the differentiation of odontoblasts. And remember, these come from a mesenchymal stem cell, but not just any mesenchymal stem cell. There's a lot of stuff up in the head that forms from basic boring old mesenchyme that comes from mesoderm. Most of our mesenchyme comes from mesoderm in the body, and it forms bones and muscles and other connective tissue stuff. However, up in the head, there's a number of very interesting structures that come from neural crest cells. And these cells, well, some of them are going to turn into neuronal stuff like cranial nerves, but others turn into neuronal mesenchymal stem cells. And these form things like the branchial arches and some of the bones and cartilages associated with those branchial arches. And some of them induce the formation of tooth buds. And these neuronal mesenchymal stem cells are the ones that can be induced to form odontoblasts if they get the correct morphogen. So in my little cartoon over here to the right, what I'm trying to show you is that a neural crest cell, if it's given the right morphogen, can turn into a neuron or an odontoblast. So what determines whether it turns into a neuron in the hippocampus uh, may be one of those special types of neurons that can keep undergoing mitosis even as we get older, or whether it turns into an odontoblast and forms that very important substance called dentin in our jaws depends on a second signal. And that second signal is a different type of morphogen found within the extracellular matrix. The brain has very little extracellular matrix, whereas in the mandibles and maxilla, there's a lot of extracellular matrix, 
because we're forming that mesenchyme there. So the take home lesson here is that if you want to induce the formation of dentin following an injury, one thing that we are currently doing is adding some of the raw materials to that injury site such as MTA or biodentine. These mineral aggregates seem to help the newly formed odontoblasts to create more dentin. But one thing that we're learning is that we can help new odontoblasts to form from the mesenchymal stem cells that are still found in the pulp. And all you have to do is give them the right morphogen. So I was really surprised to learn that this drug here seems to help induce the formation of tertiary dentin. And that's because of my background in Alzheimer's research. I remembered somewhere in the back of my brain that that sounded somewhat familiar. And it is indeed an Alzheimer's drug. It seems to help neurons to grow, reducing the rate at which people develop the signs and symptoms of dementia. But this drug works by inducing the Wnt signaling pathway, the same pathway that helps mesenchymal stem cells to turn into odontoblasts. And so this Alzheimer's drug can be added to teeth to help the formation of new odontoblasts, which then can remineralize dentin, forming tertiary dentin after an injury. Now, to my knowledge, this is not happening in humans yet, but because this drug has been approved for human use, I wouldn't be surprised if this is happening in dentistry soon. Next up, let's talk about some of the clinical significance of all of the things that we've learned. And the first off is understanding dentinal hypersensitivity. When dentin becomes exposed, the teeth become hypersensitive to a number of different stimuli. For instance, eating foods that change the temperature of the saliva in the oral cavity, or change the pH, or change the concentration of electrolytes can be felt all the way in the teeth. Now, the enamel doesn't have any cells, and the dentin layer only has odontoblastic processes. We need to get these changes to the dendrites of neurons, which are found in the pulp. But if the dentinal tubules become exposed, there becomes a pathway all the way from the outer surface of the tooth that's now become exposed. It should have been covered by something like enamel or cementum. But once we expose that dentin, now anything on the outside of the tooth can wind up diffusing all the way to the inside of the pulp cavity, which is where the nerve endings or the dendrites are located. Therefore, exposed dentin can be very uncomfortable and even painful when patients are eating or drinking. Once again, dentin should not be exposed. It should be covered by enamel or cementum and gingiva. But with loss of those tissues, some of those dentinal tubules now become exposed to the outside world. Over time, that gets better because odontoblasts keep forming more and more dentin and they will create dentin inside of those tubules, making them narrower and narrower, which should decrease the sensitivity of any exposed dentinal tubules. Sometimes the outer covering of dentin can become accidentally exposed if it's uh, removed by professionals such as yourself. The outer coatings can also be removed by more pathological conditions, such as attrition or chemical erosion. When the gingiva undergo recession, this can expose underlying cementum, which is not as tough as enamel. And if that cementum is lost, then we can expose root dentin, 
and root dentin will stain and decay much more quickly and easily than enamel because it's a little bit softer. It doesn't have as much of that mineral component. It had a higher organic component. In the case of dentin, that was collagen. And for that reason, a dental carry will erode the dentin much more quickly than enamel. That erosion often forms a triangular shape, but soon as the triangular erosion in the enamel hits the dentin, a second triangular erosional pattern will emerge because that dentin erodes more quickly, and so it overtakes the loss of the enamel. Dentin can be resorbed or lost over time, and this can be made apparent under a radiograph. We usually don't know why this happens, but if the pulp chamber seems to get enlarged, that's a sign of dentin resorption. This occurs normally during the exfoliation of the primary teeth, but it can happen again in adulthood accidentally. Okay, on to the second of two parts where I'm going to talk about the formation of the pulp. Pulp is a type of connective tissue, which means it's forming from mesoderm, or in this case, some mesoderm mixed with neuromesenchyme. A bunch of mesenchymal stem cells are found down here in the dental papilla. Remember, it was the outer layer of these cells that turned into odontoblasts because they received a signal from the inner enamel epithelium as it differentiated into pre-ameloblasts. But the rest of these mesenchymal stem cells are going to form the pulp. So the pulp chamber is composed of both coronal and radicular pulp. And there might be small amounts of pulp found within accessory canals. Coronal pulp is up in the crown. It has pulp horns. These get smaller as the teeth ages because of the additional layers of dentin being formed throughout life by those odontoblasts that we still have. Radicular pulp is found in the roots and it extends all the way to the apical foramen. The apical foramen is the exit. This forms around blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic vessels and periodontal ligament. The overlying dentin and cementum are forming after those other structures. There might be accessory canals found within the roots. That happens when Hertwig's epithelial root sheath bumps into a blood vessel that's already down there. So this is where you would find those accessory canals. Sometimes you can find them up in the corona as well. And again, that happens when epithelial cells are extending downwards, trying to form the roots of the teeth. And we'll cover that in more detail in the next chapter and they bump into an already formed blood vessel. So they grow around that. Similar to the way all of the foramen and the skull form, there's already blood vessels and nerves because the formation of the circulatory system and neurulation happen before ossification of bone tissue. In the pulp, we find four basic areas that we differentiate simply based off of what they look like under the microscope. The first location is something we've already talked about, a layer of odontoblasts. Then we find some empty space, then we find some more cells, or at least that's what it looks like under the microscope. And then lastly is the pulp core at the very center. That's where you'd find most of the blood vessels and nerve fibers. The odontoblastic layer 
again, is the outer layer next to the dentin. This is where the living odontoblasts can be found. Their tiny little odontoblastic processes would be extended upwards through the layer of dentin. Because these odontoblasts are still alive after a tooth erupts, it allows dentin to be repaired following injury in adulthood. Next is the cell-free zone, which actually does have cells. They're just hard to see under traditional stains under the microscope. Then you find an area where the cells are much more visible. That's called the cell-rich zone. And then lastly is the pulp core. And again, because this is all connective tissue, we're finding a lot of extracellular matrix here, which should include collagen and fibronectin fibers and a bunch of ground substance as well, a more gelatinous material. That allows more nerve endings and capillaries to grow or to recede, should that be necessary. But even though the pulp has different layers to it, keep in mind it is a connective tissue. And as such, it is full of basic connective tissue cells, mostly fibroblasts and the mesenchymal stem cells they come from. There were that layer of odontoblasts in the outermost region. Those are highly specialized connective tissue cells. Fibroblasts, on the other hand, make the things that most connective tissues make, collagen, fibronectin, and ground substance. The last two are also examples of types of cells found in connective tissue, mast cells and B cells. These are types of white blood cells, which also come from mesenchymal stem cells. In this case, they probably came from stem cells found in the bone marrow, which first differentiated into a type of cell that was limited to becoming just a type of blood cell, either red or one of the five different types of white blood cells, and then migrated into the pulp tissue. Mast cells you will be familiar with if you have allergies, because these types of white blood cells release histamines in response to an infection. B cells are a type of lymphocyte which produce antibodies, which can attack specific antigens found on pathogens like viruses or bacteria. If inflammation of the pulp does occur, we call this pulpitis, itis being our suffix that we add to the end of anything that becomes inflamed. There are nerve endings within the pulp. The sensitivity of those nerve endings can be tested by pulp vitality testing. Healthy pulp should be very sensitive to little electrical shocks. Whereas if the pulp begins to die, then it becomes less sensitive to little electrical shocks. If pulp is dying, it might need to be replaced and removed by endodontic therapy or a root canal. And all of the living tissue can be removed and be replaced by rubber. In this case, that rubber is gutta percha, a latex derived from trees that grow in Malaysia, which used to be where we got most of our rubber from, including all of the rubber that was made into tires on vehicles used in World War II. So there was a lot of interest in maintaining control of Malaysia. But it was thanks to World War II that a lot of interest was placed into trying to develop synthetic forms of rubber and so most other rubbers that we use in industry today are derived from petroleum products. But for whatever reason, and I'm not really sure why, I just find it interesting, the rubber that's used in root canal therapy is still the gutta percha derived from these trees. But if the pulp is removed, that means all of the living cells of the teeth have been removed and that tooth is no longer vital 
you still have the mineral components of dentin and enamel, but any damage to that dentin will not be repaired. Therefore, damage will accumulate over time. Furthermore, any chemicals that wind up in the pulp cavity can begin diffusing into the dentin, causing staining to that tooth. Those teeth may become brittle over time as any small cracks are not repaired and are allowed to develop into bigger cracks within the underlying dentin. There may be little pulp stones. These are little deposits of dentin found within the pulp. That's not too surprising considering that odontoblasts are derived from mesenchymal stem cells, which are also found in the pulp. So if one of those mesenchymal stem cells accidentally turns into an odontoblast, maybe it, for some weird reason, gets that Wnt signal that normally came from the pre-ameloblasts, it could begin secreting dentin in here, forming a pulp stone. This is different from an enamel pearl that we learned about in the previous lecture, uh, but once again should be asymptomatic and is only a problem when it comes to endodontic therapy. Because odontoblasts are still present in teeth after they erupt, they're going to keep forming more dentin, albeit at a much slower rate than they did during embryological development. But nevertheless, the pulp cavity will recede over time. This is going to be no most noticeable in those smaller pulp horns. Those will begin to fill up with dentin and recede with age. So that wraps up the physiology of both dentin and pulp. So let me wrap up with a few quiz questions. First off, what's the most likely reaction to destruction of an area? How are those odontoblasts going to respond? First, will they make more odontoblasts from the epithelial rests of malasse? Well, now, before you start worrying about trying to remember what these epithelial rests are, or perhaps you don't know yet because they're coming up in the next lecture, uh, all you really need to focus on is this word here, epithelial. Are odontoblasts epithelial? No, they come from mesenchymal stem cells, which are a type of connective tissue. So we can rule that one out without worrying about what Malasse named stuff after. Next, do new odontoblasts form from other odontoblasts? Well, typically speaking, if you don't remember whether this happens or not, the bottom line to anything happening in development is that the more specialized and differentiated a cell is, the less capable it is of mitosis. For instance, in the skin, keratinocytes did not divide to form new keratinocytes. They all came from stem cells down in the stratum basale, that basal layer of the epithelial portion of the gingiva. And it's the same with odontoblasts. They are highly specialized. Now you can make new ones, but they do not come from old odontoblasts. They instead come from mesenchymal stem cells. So hopefully we're going to see that word in the next two. And uh-oh, I don't see mesenchymal stem cells here. Crap, I was hoping to find that word in one of these answers, and I'm not. So now I have to think a little bit harder. Would you find mesenchymal stem cells in the cell-rich layer? Well, where is the cell-rich layer? Well, that was in the pulp. And the pulp is the connective tissue portion of a tooth, and mesenchymal stem cells are found in connective tissue. So yes, this is the correct answer here. Okay, next question. The counterpart of Tomes processes. Uh, I don't like this question, because Tomes process is found in an ameloblast, which is an epithelial cell. I think the answer that they're looking for here is the odontoblastic process, which is a long squiggly tube found in a cell that's part of a connective tissue. I 
really would not consider that a counterpart at all. But, eh, I guess functionally they're kind of counterparts. It's just their embryological lineage is not similar at all. So let's just run with it. That's the best answer there. Next question. After odontogenesis, where would you find the cell bodies of odontoblasts? Oh, I think I remember that. That's down in the pulp somewhere. So do any of these answers have that? Oh, yes, right here. They are in the outer layer of the pulp tissue. You don't have to remember what Tome's granular layer is. You don't have to remember what primary or secondary dentin are. That might be helpful when it comes to exam time. But as far as this question goes, don't get distracted by the incorrect answers. Lastly, I just have a couple of actual histology slides of developing teeth. Now let me go through this really quickly. If you see any images like this, what you're really looking for first, I think, should be where's the enamel versus where's the dentin. Both enamel and dentin should be pretty solid. So I see some pretty solid layers here and another layer of solid stuff down here. So enamel should be the outer layer over here. That leaves the deeper layer here to be dentin. And hopefully I'll find the cell bodies of the odontoblasts. And sure enough, that's what you're looking at over here. These darker circles are the nucleuses of the odontoblasts that make the dentin. If you look closely at the dentin, you should be able to notice that it's got a darker and a lighter pink. That's because we initially secrete pre-dentin. That's the lighter pink down here. And it later mineralizes to form the more mature dentin up here. That means this is the pulp cavity down here. I see a bunch of cells. These are probably mesenchymal stem cells still. Some of them are going to turn into fibroblasts and maybe some capillaries and stuff later. What about up here? Oh, I think I see some nucleuses. These are the ameloblasts. They are making the enamel in this direction. So this tooth hasn't erupted yet. It's still growing within the mandible or the maxilla. So over here, it looks like I've got some more just mesoderm. This is probably a mesenchyme, a generic connective tissue. But some of that connective tissue is starting to ossify and look more like bone tissue. In this case here, I think I'm seeing compact bone because it seems to be arranged in osteons. So there's a number of things here in these embryological images that you would not see in adulthood. For instance, the dentin over here in adulthood should have a thin layer of cementum that would then come into direct contact with the bone, connected via periodontal ligament. There wouldn't be this thick layer of generic connective tissue still. Secondly, and I haven't covered this yet in the lectures, but you're not going to find ameloblasts after a tooth erupts. So those are some of the key characteristics that we've already learned about here on an actual histology slide. But that wraps up this lecture on dentin and pulp formation.